It's time for Africa, time to discuss matters that affect the continent. Thank you for joining us on the show. And this week, we host James Mwangi, who is a managing partner at Dahlberg, an international strategy consulting firm. He's based in Johannesburg, South Africa. He shares his insights with us. You get to have your say on the issues as well. And we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. James Mwangi is the global managing partner of Dalberg, an international strategy consulting firm with 12 offices across the globe. He's based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Prior to this, James founded and led Dalberg's business in Africa after helping build its first office in New York. Clients range from heads of state to senior leaders of multilateral organizations and foundations. Before this, James worked at McKinsey & Company in New York, serving clients mostly in the financial services sector. James holds an honours degree in economics from Harvard University. He's a 2009 Archbishop Tutu Leadership Fellow of the African Leadership Institute and serves on the Institute's board. He's also a 2013 Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum and currently serves on the Programme Advisory Committee of the Clinton Global Initiative. Let's get his insights into Africa. It's great to have you with us on the Africa Leadership Dialogues, James. Thank you so here. much for making time. Thank you very much. Young African man, mm -hmm. amazing educational portfolio, mm -hmm. um, now working with Dalberg. Tell us your story. Start at the beginning. Tell us how you grew up, a mm -hmm. little bit about your education, right. what you're doing right now. Right. Um, thank you, Julie. Um, I was born, like many of your audience in, uh, in Kenya, I was born in Nairobi, grew up uh, uh, in the public school system, went to, I'll, I'll actually list every school I went to, mm -hmm. went to Our Lady of Mercy Primary School, public school in, uh, in, in South B, in Nairobi, uh, was fortunate enough to get into Alliance High School um, four years. And at the end of that, um, was asked by my principal to you know, consider applying, or by my deputy principal at that time, to consider applying to US universities. Didn't know much about it, submitted an application. Uh, to my surprise, uh, was accepted at Harvard. Um, Did your parents have the money to, to take you to the US? The beauty of that was actually it didn't matter. So Harvard and a few other universities in the US have uh, a policy they call need, need blind admission. And so while my parents were able to put in a little bit of the cost, maybe five to 10%, uh, the university basically has a policy that says, if they accept you, then they will give you the resources you need in order to attend. Now, some of that is in the form of loans, some of it is in the form of a, of a scholarship, but they accepted me and I was able to, to attend for four years. Mm. Uh, and after that, I was very keen on, on working in development, um, but I wasn't sure how, and I applied to all the usual places, the World Bank, the UN system, and, and the rest, and none of them really responded quickly. At the same time, I, I began to feel like I needed to have some exposure to business. So I joined a consulting firm, McKinsey & Company, uh, in New York, um, and spent two years there working with private sector companies for the most part in finance, uh, logistics, and so on, uh, essentially helping them develop strategies um, to get better at their business. Um, and uh, it was at the end of that period that I made the decision to, to jump and help uh, the team that was getting Dahlberg off the ground. Right. And with Dahlberg now, mm -hmm. what's the focus of the work that you do? Um, Dahlberg is in, is in some ways a very simple story and in some other ways a, a complicated story. We are a strategy consulting uh, and advisory firm, but we are, we are that with a difference. So we work with clients across the public, private and social sectors, and we do the same kind of consulting work that any other world-class consulting firm would do. The only difference is that we demand that all of our work have a positive development impact. In other words, we, need, we only take on assignments that we believe will enhance the world's inclusiveness or sustainability in one way or another. 
what that plays out as is that we mostly focus on either working with the development sector, with governments, with foundations, um, but then also with companies in cases where we're trying to get them to think of either uh, the excluded majority as customers, as employees, as sources of resources, etc. And so unlike many other international or global consulting firms, we've ended up focusing our efforts where most people only think of as an afterthought. So Africa for us is really a big part of the heart of what we do, uh, as is East Asia as, and South Asia, as is Latin America. Uh, in a way, we're the reverse of a typical firm that will say, well, our, our center and our focus is Europe, the US, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Japan and China. Instead, we say our focus is, is these other countries where we think the massive opportunity for creating prosperity really exists. exists. Yeah. Wow. So let, let's come to Africa today yeah. and the potential on the continent. I was yeah. just reading recently that uh, Eric Schmidt of uh, Google yeah. said they are now getting more clicks mm -hmm. on their AdSense uh, adverts mm -hmm. in Africa than they are in Europe. And so his focus now mm -hmm. has shifted. You know, a lot of people saying that Obviously, the growth in the markets of Africa mm -hmm. um, is going to be significant yeah. looking at the saturated markets of, mm -hmm. of the West. And mm -hmm. uh, what do you see in terms yeah. of potential for Africa? So Africa, uh, uh, Africa is a complicated story. On the one hand, there are some really exciting underlying trends here. If you look at history in general, you find that for most countries that come out of a colonial experience, you typically go through a period of 30 to 40 years of just working that out uh, in terms of a generational and mindset shift, etc., before you can really take off and start to, uh, to grow. You look at what happened with India where in the late 80s, early 90s, things began to change and it began to build momentum. Now granted, it's, it's having issues now, but it changed the way that the country thought of itself and what aspirations it had. Africa is entering that phase now. We're seeing a, a final shift away from the language of, of, of anti-colonialism, for example, into saying, well, what are we going to do with the freedom that we have? So that's one bit of good news, and you're starting to see it in the way that we want to do bigger things. The other bit of good news is we're the youngest continent. Uh, and that has two sides to it, but let's talk about the good side of that first. That means we have the most dynamic and youngest workforce in the world, and it's gonna get bigger and bigger over the next few years. Now, all of that means that we have the potential to be a tremendously you know, productive part of the world's economy. We can be the world's workshop if we put our minds to it. At the same time, Africa is the least explored continent for a range of natural resources. Our agriculture is tremendously unproductive. In other words, we don't get as much out of our land as we could. Basically, on every single dimension of economic activity, we are very far from where we could be. Now, on one hand, that's bad news because it means we are not make, take, making the most of our potential today. On the other hand, it means that if we're serious about seizing that potential, the, the, world, the sky is the limit, the world is our oyster. But that brings me to the flip side of it. That youth bulge, that youth dividend, that demographic dividend can turn into a, a time bomb. And we're seeing it in North Africa, in other parts of the continent. In other words, if we don't create the equitable and sustainable society that is creating the jobs for people, then we will be swept away. I had a fascinating tweet from, from someone. Uh, we were discussing innovation and young people. Mm -hmm. You've just talked about the youth bulge. And, and this young person said, um, if the youth are not economically empowered, they yeah. cannot become productive. Yeah. But let's define that. Mm -hmm. What do we need then to do mm -hmm. to ensure that we get the most out of the youth bulge on the continent? I think it's a few things. Um, one, at the end of the day, getting the most out of people is about tapping into their potential. And everything I'm going to say is, is, is nothing new. It's about getting people the basic skills they need to be effective in an economy through education. Education and training. And training. Mm -hmm. And not stopping there because very often we do education and training in one corner and then we say now go out and find jobs. Mm -hmm. Actually the way it should work is you should integrate the process, the transition from learning to earning needs to be a smooth one. You think about traditional societies. There wasn't a day when you say, when you're told, okay, now you're no longer a child, you will go out and work. You slowly became an apprentice. You learned how to, to work in a trade. You did more and more work on your own. And then one day you looked around and said, oh, I'm self-sufficient. You look at economies like Germany's, 
for many, many years, their whole setup for the bulk of their population was one that revolved around apprenticeships, around learning a trade, around learning to work in their medium-sized industries, and then transitioning into the workplace. Our problem in Africa is we've created this idea that first you're in school, and when you're in school, all you do is read books, and then you go into the workplace and you apply this knowledge that you picked up. Your challenge is even the youth with university degrees show up patently unprepared for the challenges of the workplace. That is true. Right? And let alone the ones from with a primary or secondary school education. And so the real challenge for us is focusing on that bridge. It's focusing on that transition from being someone who is picking up skills to someone who's applying them in the workplace and giving people just the soft skills around how you behave in a workplace, how you expect to be treated. So who's Whose role? Wh whose role is that? Is is that you know? Does that fall on the universities? Does that fall on on some kind of uh, transitional process between universities? Mm -hmm. Is it then private sector that should yeah. come in and say we want to play a role in mm -hmm. this? How do you see this working? All of the above. Okay. Um, we're doing a lot of work now in in South Africa and indeed across the continent, looking at exactly that question of how do you manage that transition. And we've been focusing on high school graduates because a majority of African youth mm -hmm. are going to be leaving school with either a primary school education or a secondary school education. Mm -hmm. Very few will actually get a university education, although the, the lessons still apply there. And what we are finding is we have a paradox in Africa. On the one hand, we are saying that there's a lot of youth without jobs. On the other hand, there's many industries that are saying they can't find the people to hire or that the cost of acquiring talent is so high, not just because it's hard to find the right person, but because you hire one, they stay for three months, you have to dismiss them or they leave, and you hire another one. So that churning of people in and out of the workplace is bad for the employer, but it's also bad for the young person. Some analysis recently, which I found shocking, said that if a young person is able to stay in their first job for a year, their chances of staying in employment throughout their lives go up by 80%. So the reason why you see people unemployed out on the street today very often is because they never got that first opportunity to sit in a job, learn what it means to pull down a wage in a situation where they are being coached, they are being helped. And once you get through that first year, you're okay. You can find the next job and then the job after that. Plus you're a cheaper employee for your employer because they brought you in, they didn't waste three or six months orienting you in the mm -hmm. workplace. You actually stayed and, and gave them value. So it's actually getting, everyone you talked about, the educational institution, the employer, and very often some social sector player, to sit down and say, how do we help these youth get what they need? If you look at an advanced economy, your parents can tell you how to behave in a workplace because they're in that same kind of workplace. The majority of our youth are coming from a rural uh, subsistence agriculture background. There's no one who's going to tell them how to behave in an office or in a workshop in their household. So you have to do that work for, you have, you have to create a structure that does that for them. That's fascinating. Thank mm. you for sharing that information. And mm. I think, you know, a lot of people right now thinking about how they can play a role, whether you're in private sector, whether you're in education, um, maybe you need to start thinking of how you can play a role in being part of that transitional uh, element there. Um, let's talk about government yeah. now. And, and there's definitely the problem that in, in many ways we are over-reliant mm -hmm. on government. Absolutely. And we look at government as the beginning and the end of yeah. everything. Um, you know, the aid mentality. Yeah. At the same time, there are many areas that government should be subsidizing yeah. that it's not. Mm -hmm. Where's the balance? So, um, it's, it, if, if I had the answer in three <laughs> sentences, I would be somewhere else. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, it's an ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. I will say that there's a lot of research now that is proving that two, there's two camps of people out there. There's a camp of people saying, aid has not made any country rich. Uh, and, and that actually you need private industry and private investment to grow economies. There's another camp that says actually development assistance over the last uh, de you know, few decades has done a tremendous amount to help people in situations that they would not otherwise have been helped out of. The funny thing is they're both exactly right. The reality is aid and very often government assistance are very good at tackling things that are not well served in the market. You're not going to say, okay, Haiti has just been destroyed in an earthquake, which company is gonna go in and help these people and sell products? They've got nothing. 
nor are you going to say, in particularly in questions of health for the very poorest, or, th there's a whole range of areas where the market just won't provide. And in those cases, when well-focused and well-structured, aid has made a difference. Millions of children have been saved who would otherwise be mm. dead were it not for vaccines or medical treatments of a certain kind. Where I think we've gone wrong is where we've assumed that aid is the key to then unlocking long-term development growth or unlocking the path to prosperity. And, and very often the danger is you start providing assistance saying, oh, we're only helping in the most desperate cases or in the cases where the market won't provide. But over time, you, you shift the way people think in an economy. Instead of launching a business, I launch a money-making NGO. Uh, instead of trying to uh, think through what the next big opportunity is, I'm focusing on telling you a sad story about my country so you can give me a grant. And that's where aid can be a problem. But a lot of that is a mindset issue. It requires us, not, as, not just at the government level, but as individuals to say, you need to dream big. At the end of the day, if you look at, even today, if you look at the size of the aid flows into Africa versus the amount of wealth that can be created and is being created out of, you know, just making the most of our human and natural resources, aid is a tiny number or a relatively small number. The problem is we don't think big. Um, and so what you then see is people being content um, to chase the next million dollar grant or, or rather than to say, how do I build a globally competitive economy or country, right? We should not be talking about in all of Africa only a few entrepreneurs at the level of Alandiko Dangote. There's room for dozens of those people. But are we seeing them in Kenya, in Rwanda, in, in Ghana, etc.? Are we seeing those people who are saying, I'm not going to be satisfied just with you know, the scraps I want to build a competitive world-class business. And it could be a long journey, yeah. but starting the journey is possibly key, having the, the confidence. It starts with a step. Another interesting thing, and, and, and maybe this is a different angle to think about, mm -hmm. is even in those areas where aid is effective, I think we are seeing ways that we can think of bringing in the private sector. In Kenya, we have seen a lot of companies do very well at combining uh, at finding a role in helping development assistance flow, but then also building viable businesses. You think about the way that, for example, Equity Bank has been visionary in, 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 in aligning the activities of its foundation with engaging the mass market, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the work Safaricom has done uh, as well, making use of their m technology and opening it up for a range of development applications. I think there's a lot of opportunities there. A, a good example is, is some of the work we've been doing in Mozambique around rethinking how you pay for healthcare. Now, malaria is a big problem everywhere in Africa, and we typically think of malaria as something that we can only address through government. But government alone very often is not enough. And what people ignore is that malaria is tremendously costly to the private sector. So what we've been thinking about is what if you said to the private sector, how much will you pay if in X number of years, malaria is eradicated in your area. Don't pay it now, just pay it when the cost of malaria is removed from your books. And they will make a certain commitment of a certain sum of money. Turns out that sum of money is actually large enough that you can eliminate malaria, not just from the company's workers, which is impossible anyway, but from the entire district that the company is operating in. It's fascinating. And so then you then approach impact investors or, or NGOs or, and say, if you're willing to invest up front, or in, and even the government, if you're willing to make the expenditures up front, someone will pay back that money in the future. And it's in thinking about things in that way and saying, where is it that we can unlock these pools of value? Imagine if we said, how much will you pay if I can keep youth in employment for a year in five years from now? And you said, it's such and such an amount. I no longer need to go and beg for grants. I just go and borrow from the bank, do my business, at the end of the day, if I can produce well-employed, well-positioned youth, I get my money and I grow and, and go do something else. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. You've mentioned mindset mm -hmm. a few times yes. already in this interview. Possibly... For me, mm -hmm. that is the greatest threat mm -hmm. that the African continent faces, mm -hmm. is, is the lack of self-belief, mm -hmm. lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say 
to people watching this show today, mm -hmm. and particularly America was able to sell the narrative mm -hmm. that America is the land of opportunity, mm -hmm. and yet there's incredible inequality in Indeed. America, there's incredible poverty, there's, and, and, and how do we start to make the African populations aware mm -hmm. of the opportunities that exist in spite of all the challenges? So I think it's, um, the first thing to recognize is the opportunity exists, but it's not neat and tidy. Mm -hmm. Doing the stuff that makes a difference long term is rarely glamorous and clean. And, when and, you is, start. It, and is it, is it, is it ever in even any other part of the world? It, all, everywhere in the world, right. <laughs> the people who actually shift, you don't, you don't start the companies that will change the world or the movements that will change the world in a neat air conditioned office. And, and I think the problem in Africa is there are people who are willing to dream big, but they want a shortcut either to comfort or to success. Um, and people need to understand that actually the paths to prosperity start in the greasy workshop with dirt under your fingernails, or they start in the firm, in the, in the farm with, with dust on your clothes and in your shoes. There is something about saying, get out there, get your hands dirty, and work from the bottom up. Uh, build the hard way, and recognize that there's so much opportunity out there that if you can prove that you can do things self-sufficiently, then you can always continue to grow. I think our challenge is everyone will say, well, Africa is exciting. Now, where is my, my nice job where I can get be part of this story? No one is saying, well, I'll take a risk and not earn a salary for six months and start something, or I'll join a small, a small back of the, you know, uh, you know a, a small little business somewhere that hasn't been proven and I'll help it grow or I'll take a non-glamorous job in government and actually figure out how to deliver a particular service. It's not about be giving the press conferences or flying in the jets. It's about getting the services done. And I think the big disconnect in Africa, I don't think is really self-belief. It can be a little bit of that, but it's an understanding that there are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So that for, for those of us who have had the educational opportunities, etc., people arrive and you just want to the culture of the deal. I talked about this uh, with some business school students a few months ago. It's the culture of chasing the big deal. You sign, you get the money, and now you've won, rather than the culture of building from scratch and saying, okay, on Monday morning, what's happening on the, on the factory floor? Do I understand every aspect of this thing? Do I understand why those people there are struggling with malaria and how it affects my business? It's that. It's it's. Maybe the neatest way I can say it is a saying that I picked up in high school and I use it way too often, is we're so obsessed with, with the big picture and the big things, but the reality is if you're too big to do little things, then you're probably too little to do big things. If you're too big to do little things, then you're, you're too, little too little to do big, to do things. big things. Wow, so powerful. What would you say to Africa leadership right now? What are the virtues, the qualities they most need to succeed in the world today? Walking the talk. Um, there is a lot of people who are now able to tell an inspiring and exciting story about Africa. And the conference circuit is full of them. It's about what you do Monday morning. It's about rolling up your sleeves and, and delivering on a project. It's about moving from, you know, lots of pictures of what, you know, the capital city will look like in 10 years to construction sites and making sure those construction sites have workers and bricks and cement. And it's about, like I said, the unglamorous work of sitting in front of a spreadsheet trying to figure out, you know, how will these numbers add up? Or better yet, the hard work of sitting in the construction site with the construction worker saying, you know, what is it you're building? If you're a business knowing the regular person on the street and what they need and what they, they require and what they expect from you and how you meet those needs. Um, and, and so it's really about getting away from this notion that you can theoretically build a, a new Africa and say that you will need to go where the people are and engage with them in what they're doing. And actually, if the job isn't feeling a little bit hard and isn't challenging you, then you're probably doing it wrong. Because what we're trying to do is a big task, the task that will have massive rewards, but if it was easy, anyone would do it. We, we, we in many ways, are, are at the cusp. Mm -hmm. And some of our countries are moving forward. Mm -hmm. Others seem to be regressing. Yeah. Um, some are stagnating. Mm -hmm. What do you see 
-hmm. in Africa 20 years from now? I'll, I'll say what I hope. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that we will see the same kind of dynamic that we've seen everywhere else in, in the world, where a few countries will lead the way and demonstrate to the others what is possible and cause people to ask more, not just of their leaders, but of themselves. So you look at Asia, and I think Japan played a huge role in shifting the expectations of Asian people and Asian leaders about what they could accomplish. And then everyone was saying, well, if those guys can do it, why can't we? I think similarly in Africa, we've, we've gotten away with for many, many decades uh, talking about how so-and-so is the best in sub-Saharan Africa or south of the Sahara, north of the Limpopo, east of Lake Victoria. <laughs> you know, you, you basically decide, you know, we're all competing to be we, the we, tallest midget. Right, we don't benchmark to global standards. Exactly. We, we, yeah. it's, it's, yes, we're all doing badly, but I'm doing the least badly of all of us. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. And I think what we need and what I think is going to happen is we're going to see a few breakthrough stories, either at the level of institutions and companies and organizations or at the level of countries, where we're able to say that's a country that has the same kind of colonial experience that we do, and they're doing it right in the following ways and it's translating into the following ways. Um, I would hope as a patriotic Kenyan that Kenya is one of those that's among the first to crack it. We have a lot of things in our favor, mm -hmm. but we also have a few things that we need to work out. I think that's the first thing, is get some good examples out there. I think the second thing is something about people understanding that when you chase the small score, you know, the easy profit, the, the quick embezzlement from the budget for the bridge, um, <laughs> It's, it's almost, I think of it as, as pesanane corruption, right? You, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's two million from the cement from the bridge, whereas actually you could create a two billion dollar economy if the mm -hmm. bridge were built and then you thought about what are the things you can do on either side of the river. What and are you providing the markets that are then created? Exactly, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. So mm -hmm. how is it that you dream a bit bigger and also recognize that at the end of the day you pursue wealth because you want a material state, you know, level of comfort for yourself and your, and your descendants. People need to recognize that a part of that is building a society that you can be proud of. I want my children to grow up in a place where they're not worried for their lives, safety and property, in a place where they think that things are fair and that they know that uh, others have the opportunity to succeed as well. At some point, taking that additional, exploiting my government or the opportunities on the ground just for that additional few dollars isn't getting me closer to that. It's just meaning that whatever little we're able to scrap together from, 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 from the marketplace, we'll be spending all our time guarding and worrying about. In many ways, we've made heroes in our communities, whether west or east, north or south. We've, we've made heroes of those embezzlers, and we've made yeah. heroes of those who are able to make that quick buck. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could get to a point where, as opposed to seeing the government as the enemy, mm -hmm. looking to defraud the government, we could actually see ourselves as yeah. one community yeah. and say, what am I giving? Yeah. What am I putting into, as much as I'm seeking to benefit and live a good life? Can we make it there? Well, as, I, as, as fractured as many of our nations are. Right. Well, I, I, I think so because there isn't a single country that's wealthy today that hasn't gone through this stage. Mm -hmm. um, there is a process where people think about government as this thing that you exploit. It's a, it's, 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 it belongs because it to has other exploited people. you <laughs> or you, feel, you, and you so feel you've been exploited, right? Uh, but I think at some point we need to recognize that we all gain a lot more from the government doing the right thing and, and creating the space for all of us to reach our full potential, then we gain from, you know, it's, you know, taking our turns to eat, mm -hmm. right? It's the difference between, you know, buying that bag of very expensive seeds and then cooking them and eating them instead of planting them and waiting for the harvest. And that's what we've been doing, right? Is, is the bag of seed arrives and one person looks around and says, oh, I'll grab it and go cook it right now. Fine. Total lack of any kind of vision, uh, you know, even intelligence is lacking. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's short-sighted, it's foolish, mm. and it's a zero-sum game. If, if I'm supporting you because you're the, the guy who stole the seeds is from my village this time, next time he'll be from someone else's village. And guess what? It didn't help me even if it was from my village. Right, right. So I think there's a, there's a mindset shift that'll come from just having bigger expectations of ourselves. I've no doubt it'll happen, but... 
I, I'll be honest, I get impatient for it to happen. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention various uh, sectors to you and, and just tell me what comes to mind when, sure. when I mention them. Agriculture. Um, Africa has more available ag uh, arable land than the rest of the world put together. Uh, we are approaching a new crisis in, in the world's food supply. Africa has the potential to feed the world. Right now, we produce 10% as much per hectare as the best agricultural countries in the world, despite the fact that the majority of our people are in agriculture. If we can fix that, if we can even just get to half as productive as the rest of the world in the next few years, that will mean growing our agricultural sector fivefold in a very short period of time. And if we then tap into all of the best science and so on, do sustainable agriculture over the long term, we can become the world's granary at a time when being the world's granary is actually going to be a very lucrative thing. Wow. Education. We have the youngest population. Um, we're getting better at educating them. Uh, we're having more and more of them getting to secondary education and indeed more into tertiary education. We have been dismal at connecting them to jobs. If we are able to collaborate between employers and the educational sector and build the right kinds of partnerships, it'll be possible both for the private sector to cut the costs of their human capital development because they're getting people who are ready for the workplace and for education to very clearly convert into meaningful and sustainable jobs. But that requires us rethinking the idea that the university dons and syllabus setters sit in one room and the employers sit in another room. Mm -hmm. They need to sit in one room and say, what are we doing to give people the experiences they need over the duration of their life that prepare them for the workplace and create the workforce of the future? Right. Infrastructure. Um, we have a massive infrastructure deficit. There are trillions of dollars worth of, of, of stuck infrastructure projects or even not yet envisaged infrastructure projects. A frightening statistic. If every single power plant that's currently on the books in Africa that's planned to be built is built over the next 10 years, the number of people without electricity in their home will either stay the same or increase. That's if everything happens according to plan. So we actually need to redouble our efforts and recognize that everything from access to clean energy, transportation, communications, those are the things that unlock the power of an economy. If you have energy, you can do a whole lot of other things. Our challenge is that no one is doing the nitty-gritty work of developing the projects. I talked earlier about rolling up your sleeves. Everyone's looking for the big deal. Mm -hmm. No one's going out there and saying, okay, I'll do the feasibility work. I'll actually prepare a project that is ready to attract investment, both domestic and foreign. And finally, we're not tapping our own indigenous capital, right? Our, our money is stuck in our mattresses. In some cases, it's stuck in, uh, in poorly invested, you know, um, types of funds, we're not really thinking about how Africa's own wealth can unlock the value of Africa's infrastructure, or how we can get creative about paying for infrastructure mm -hmm. using the wealth that's still in the ground, whether in our agriculture or in our mining. Do you think, though, that Africa Development Bank is starting to play that play that role? Um, they're doing a great job, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, Dalberg does a lot of work with the bank. I have a great deal of respect for mm -hmm. the work that, uh, particularly, Dr. Kaberuka and his team have done over the last. Uh, few years in really reorienting the bank towards infrastructure. It is a great first step, right. but it is not going to be enough. And we cannot think of infrastructure as a purely public sector question. If you think about where the US's infrastructure came from, you know, their rail network covering the, you know, much of the continent, a good chunk of it, was, of it was built in a 30 year period financed by private sector entrepreneurship, the Vanderbilts of the world, the Carnegies of the world. The question is, where are those people in Africa? Mm. And who is it that's specializing in not chasing the deal and, 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 and carrying the briefcase around, <laughs> but in building the capability to bring infrastructure projects to, to reality? Quality infrastructure quality. projects. Exactly. Finally, please look into the camera and give your message to Africa. Our challenge as Africa is ultimately to combine prosperity with purpose. It is to find a way to create a society of the future where all of us are moving away from our past um, and both prospering materially, but also prospering together. Our big challenge, our very, very big challenge is the desire for shortcuts. And my hope is that as a continent, we are at a point now 
where we are willing to, first of all, think hard about the opportunities and bring our heads to the opportunities that are out there, but also apply our hearts to thinking about the society as a whole, recognizing that when you combine the two things, a caring for your society and where it's going, as well as an insight into opportunities, that's when you create a prosperous society of the future, and that's when you create that true uh, gem of a, of a future that we're all excited about. You can't do it with one or the other. It has to be both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Powerful stuff. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm James Irongo Mwangi, Global Managing Partner of uh, Dalberg, and you are watching Africa Leadership Dialogues. What an informative interview. I hope you feel like you've learned something new tonight. Let's take a look now at your views on the issues. This week we asked you, how can a public-private partnership be achieved in Africa in order to promote equitable and sustainable development? Katende Abdul says, for any successful development in Africa, the youth have to be the main target. Peace and unity should be promoted among African youth, leading to patriotism, hence booming a one-voice development on the black man's continent. Ocheng Makokoe says, I would say formulate policies, but it's one thing to formulate and another to implement. Fight bureaucracy in the public sector. Identify the common goals of the private and public sectors. Marry the education sector to these goals and there you have it, an equitable and sustainable Africa. Hi, my name is Esther Simato. I'm watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues from Nairobi. I think that uh, public-private partnerships should take joint actions and improve efforts at working together by networking through research centers that promote activities aimed at sustainable development, um, such as renewable energy and technology transfers. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. And on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254 And now, Africa's top 10. On Africa's top 10 this week, we feature the World Economic Forum African Young Global Leaders of 2013. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Nishan Degnarain, Senior Economic Advisor to the Minister of Finance and Economic Development, Mauritius. With degrees in Development Economics from Cambridge University and Kennedy School of Government, Harvard, Nishan is also an engagement manager with McKinsey and Company. He is also involved in developing a growth strategy for Mauritius to move from a middle income to a high income nation, as well as positioning Mauritius as a leading gateway for investments into Africa. Coming in at number 9 is Dr. Numbuisi Ekwekwe from Nigeria. He is the founder and chairman of First Atlantic Semiconductors and Microelectronics, West Africa's leading embedded systems company with design services partnerships with Altera and Microchip. He is also a founder of the non-profit African Institution of Technology. He holds two doctoral and four master's degrees and has authored four books. He also holds a U.S. patent on a microchip used in minimally invasive surgical robots. He is also a former banking executive with Diamond Bank Lagos, a TED Fellow and a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review. At number 8 is Dr. Andrew Cooper from South Africa, president and founder of Lipfrog, the world's first microinsurance fund established in 2007. Andrew won the 2012 Ernst and Young National Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the 2012 SEN Leadership Award. Dr. Cooper is also a member of the World Economic Forum Working Group on Mainstreaming Impact Investing of the Young President's Organization and of the Clinton Global Initiative. He was educated at the University of Witwatersrand, Cambridge and Harvard. He is the author of two books on globalization and governance. 
Positioned at number 7 is South African Jasmine Bogenpo, founder and director of Harvest Advisory Services. She has experience in corporate finance and private equity acquired with KPMG, Anglo-American and Braid Private Equity. She is also a shareholder and director of African Women Chartered Accountants Investment Holdings. Jasmine is a chartered accountant in South Africa and holds bachelor's in commerce and bachelor's in accountancy degrees as well as a master's in public administration from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Mariame Jame comes in at number six. She is the founder and CEO of Sport One Global Solutions, which helps tech organizations gain a foothold in Europe, the Middle East, Africa and Asia. Born in Senegal, Mariame is a London-based CEO, blogger, technologist and social entrepreneur. She is an international speaker on technology in Africa, founder of the think tank iConscience and co-founder of Africa Gathering, the first global platform bringing together entrepreneurs to share ideas about Africa. Slotted in at number 5 is January Yusuf Makamba from Tanzania. Educated in the United States, the 38-year-old is a rising star of Tanzania's Chama Chama Pinduzi CCM party and chairman of the Parliamentary Energy Committee. January, who turns 40 in 2015, the year of the next presidential election, has been identified as a potential candidate to transform local politics. He is the first Tanzanian politician to set up a corporation for his constituency. Taking the number four spot is Alex Okosi, Nigerian-born, US-educated, senior vice president and managing director of MTV Networks Africa. He championed the MTV's move to set up MTV base in Africa in February 2005 at a period when many didn't believe there was opportunity on the African continent. Currently, he's responsible for managing the growth and development of Viacom International Media Networks Africa Business, a multi-channel portfolio that reaches over 100 million viewers and includes MTV, MTV Base, Nickelodeon, VH1, BET International and Comedy Central. Coming in at number 3 is Suleiman Kachani from Morocco. Kachani is a director of Master of Science program and director of executive education at the prestigious Columbia University. Moroccan by birth, Professor Suleiman Kachani holds a Master of Science in Operations Research from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Sloan School of Management and a Diplôme d'Ingénieur in Applied Mathematics from École Centrale Paris. Kachani is the Chief Strategy Advisor of the Strategic Capital Allocation Group a multi-billion dollar investment management firm in Boston. At number two is James Mwangi, a young Kenyan consultant at the helm of affairs at Dalberg's global managing partner in South Africa. He oversees the activities of the firm's 11 offices and more than 120 staff from his base in Johannesburg. He has served a wide range of clients including governments, multilateral institutions, private foundations, major investors and corporations across Africa and around the world. He holds a degree in economics from Harvard University and has been awarded the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellowship by the African Leadership Institute. And at number one this week is Monica Musonda from Zambia. Ms. Musonda is the former Director Legal and Corporate Affairs to the Dangote Group in Lagos, Nigeria. She is now the CEO and founder Java Foods Limited Zambia. Monica decided to move back to her home country of Zambia and set up Java Foods, a processing company which when completed will process Zambia's high-quality wheat into instant noodles for the Southern African region. She is a dual qualified English solicitor and Zambian advocate with over 15 years post-qualification experience in corporate finance, mergers and acquisition, debt and equity capital markets transactions, regulatory affairs and compliance. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. This week we end the show with a Tanzanian proverb. Many hands make light work. If each of us is able to recognize our ability to transform this continent, if we each commit to playing our role, and if we just start now, we could so easily move Africa to first world status. What a huge challenge. 
blessings to you and blessings to Africa.